So I would like to start thanking uh, Fadi Naldu and the organizers for the, the invitation to give a talk here. It's very nice to be here. And um, this is the second time that my talk follows Graziella's talk, which is uh, very nice because it's always um, enlightening. I always learn from her talk, even if it's primitive. But I have to keep up the standards, so I'll do my best. <laughs> so um, I will talk about the dark side experiment and the future liquid organ program to find dark matter. So this is a direct detection uh, experiment and program where the idea is that your dark matter will go directly to your detector. Then you will have one of the nucleus of your atom in the detector, in the case liquid organ, that will recoil and you measure the same again. So um, the idea here is to explain a little bit about this program show how our uh, recent, uh, the detector that's still working, that's the dark side 50 kilos, um, how it works and what's the technique that we use in order to um, detect dark matter. I will discuss the recent results from with dark side 20 50K, which we have recently three very interesting results. And then I will mention the future of this program with the next detector, which is dark side 20 kilos which is actually 20 tons, and beyond. So the liquid organ detector, the current status is, we have this detector here that's working now. It's located at the Grand Sasso lab. Um, and all the results I will show are based on 532 days of data um, taking with this detector. So um, we are now working on constructing the future detector, which is a 20K, which means 20 tons of liquid organ. Um, actually, it's now, it was supposed that original idea was 20K, but it will be 50 tons with 30 tons um, Kedishu. And I will talk about this later on. And now, in between these two uh, stages, we have a dark side proto, which is a prototype for dark side 20, which is actually being built at CERN. So I'll mention this detector later on. Um, so um, after that, uh, Graziella mentioned the Global Organ Dark Matter Collaboration, this is GADMC, and uh, the idea is that the three main groups that use liquid organ as a the target for dark matter detection are joining their efforts in one global collaboration, and the aim is to build a very uh, larger, much larger detector which would be Argo with 300 to 400 tons of liquid organs. So these three um, groups are joining in this um, GAD-MC collaboration. Um, so how does um, our detector work? What's the idea? So the idea I'm going to show here um, is related to all what we call a dual phase time projection chamber. So there are many um, um, xenon experiments. So um, uh, Lux and um, other Xeno experiments also use the same technique, but we have a little bit of different features. So the idea is here we have a, uh, a, a plot, a graph of how our, the, our detector. So in this larger volume here, you have liquid organ, and on the top of this, you have a small gas with uh, organ in a gas form. So the idea is that your dark matter particle will come, interact with one of the organ atoms, and interact actually with its nucleus. So in this interaction, prompt light will be, um, so you will have scintillation, will travel through the organ, and it will be detected with photomultiplier tubes here. But at the same time, you might ionize the atoms in the liquid organ, so you will have an electron then can drift upwards, and that's because we have these coils here which are produce an electric field, so they, it will travel upwards and get into the gas pocket. Once it gets into the gas pocket, it ha suffers electroluminescence and is detected up here with the, the PMTs that are in the top of the detector. So we have two signals, uh, S1, which is the prompt light, so it's the light that the scintillation that comes right after the interaction of a WIMP with the nucleus. And we have what we call ionizing signal, 
which is the electron goes up here, and it's, you have a secondary signal up there. So here's the picture of the detectors. Here are the PMTs uh, on the bottom, and the fiducial volume is around um, 37 kilos of uh, liquid argon. So there are some features of this technique that's what helps us both have an a understandable signal as well as we helps us to get rid of the background. So as I mentioned, you have two uh, signals, the S1, prompt light, the S2, and the difference in time between these two signals gives you the Z position, the vertical position in your detector where your event happened. And um, then you have the S2, and by the XY position of the phototube on the top where the, your most of the light was collected, you will have a XY reconstruction. So the drift time helps on the Z position de determination, and the light on each PMT helps the XY um, reconstruction. So we also have what we call a pulse shape discrimination, which is a very important feature, and it only uh, works in liquid organ. And I will mention it uh, in brief. So um, here's just a, a scheme of the TPC. Um, so you have a 200 uh, volts per symmetry centimeters drift field on the main, the liquid organ part, so the electrons will drift off. And in the gaseous part, you have a much higher field of 2.8 kilovolts per centimeter, which will extract the electron and it will um, produce electron luminescence. So um, where do the backgrounds come? So when we have, uh, so here's a picture of our um, argon atom. So um, you will have a lot of um, events with electron recoils. When we say electron recoils, it's mainly that your particle won't interact with the nucleus of your argon atom, but will interact with the electrons. And that's why it's called electron recoils. And examples, you have electrons and gammas that get into your detector. Most of them comes from the, the TPC uh, walls, vessels, and the cryostat that we have around the TPC that you know you have to liquefy your um, argon. So this is a background that's not so hard to get rid of. And you have nuclear recoils, which are mainly neutrons coming into your detector, and it will interact with the nucleus in the exact same way as a WIMP would. So you will have a nuclear recoil, and e for this reason, the neutrons are the most dangerous backgrounds we have, and you need to make sure that you have a background free when we see, say, a background-free experiment, it's mainly we need to get rid of the neutrons. So, so far, you had experiments that would say that you expect one neutron collision in the whole time that you um, get your data, and then if you had one event, it would be compatible with the background. But uh, all efforts of these experiments is to try to make a detector that would be background-free in the sense that you would not expect any neutrons to enter your detector. So um, I mentioned uh, pulse shape discrimination, and this works only in liquid organ, not in xenon. I'll explain why. So the idea is when you take the data, you can um, you have a graph of the time which your event uh, deposit energy in your detector, and this is the amplitude of the signal. As you can see, the electron recoil um, takes much longer, um, it's fatter in, in the pulse shape than the nuclear recoil. This is due to uh, the way that the luminescence, the, the scintillation happens, where you have a long and a short time um, um, event, so the nuclear recoils have much more um, short time events than uh, the electron recoils. So we create a parameter that we call F90. F90 is the fraction of your signal that's within 90 nanoseconds of your data taking. So as you can see, most nuclear recoils have all the signal within 90 nanoseconds, while the electron recoil, so this is microseconds here, is much broad. So if we plot this parameter here, F90, against the 
S1, which is this is the prompt scintillation light, you'll see that um, in the top are the events where most of the uh, energy is in a short time. So these are uh, nuclear recoils, while here there are electron recoils. In this way, we can get rid of the electron recoils. We mainly um, cut the events that are lower here to get rid of the electron recoils. So we um, end up with only the, to worry about neutrons and nuclear recoils backgrounds. So here um, is uh, the full detector. And what is very, very important is to shield well your detector in order to avoid that neutrons will get into your um, active detector. So the TPC I mentioned is only this little thing in the middle here. And it's surrounded by a water Cherenkov detector, which is this sphere, which has uh, mainly pure water. And then you have, um, uh, sorry, the sphere which has liquid scintillator inside. And then you have water uh, a Cher water Cherenkov detector on the outer part here. So the idea is that the liquid scintillator video will help us to prevent and understand when a neutron gets into your detector. So neutrons are strongly interacting, so you expect them to interact. If it interacts in the TPC, it should also interact outside of the TPC due to its strong interaction. So every event that has a signal in the liquid scintillator and on the TPC are excluded. And in this way, we avoid most of the neutrons. So it's an uh, active V2, and it works very well. Um, the water sharing of detector helps to avoid um, cosmic rays. So when you have a muon coming from cosmic rays, um, it will um, leave a signal here, and we also have it out of our data um, sample. So um, this is the data. So here in the, this axis, we have the prompt um, signal, the S1. And here we have this F90 parameter that I just explained. So in this little um, box here is where we expect um, a WIMP interaction with no background. So we know that in this box here, we should have no events, not even a neutron falling into this. And then, so this is the data before we did the main cuts. So here in the red box, box outer red box, is where we started doing our analysis. So we did a blind analysis in the sense that we started with this chunk of data here. We get rid, rid of the electron recoils. And we um, will not look into the data of this WIMP region at all. So we start w analyzing the data that's out here without looking in this region. And we test the cuts we use. So we test the cuts you use and say, Using these cuts in this region, we should expect one or two events. So then we um, use all the cuts and look into a region, a slice here from this line here. And then we check our cuts, see if we understand, and repeat this method all over the time. And finally, so what we get is to this picture here. So this is the WIMP box. There's no events. We did not expect any neutrons, any other particles. So if there's no events, unfortunately, there are no WIMPs too. And um, so we can exclude um, a region of the proposed models. So this is what we get. So uh, the dark side, this result I showed is here, dark side 50. As you can see, it's not so this is the WIMP mass and the cross section. So Graziella explained how you get the rate. Um, so that depends on the cross-section, the WIMP mass, and also in the HALO model that you use where we use the normally assumed parameters. Um, although we don't have one of the best results, you need to think that dark side here was 50 kilos, while the, the, the xenon experiments, the lux xenon and experiments done with xenon, um, they already was one ton or beyond one ton. So this dark side 50 was mainly a detector to prove that you can use liquid argon as a target. And it was very well, the results are very good. And it mainly proves that we can go ahead and use argon as a target for dark matter. 
And it's, in my point of view, it's very important to have complementary techniques because if you see a signal in xenon, you should see it in liquid organs. So I think it's very important to have both of these targets. So another thing I want to point out, now moving on to the other results, is that all these detectors, and including dark side, they were optimized for what was the traditional WIMP. So the traditional WIMP would it be expect uh, the cross section to be in the weak interaction cross section. We are already below what was considered um, standard, and also it was um, optimized to measure um, events above a mass of 10 GV for the dark matter mass. So as we already you know wiping a lot of the good pyrometer space, it, there's still uh, a way to go, but we started wondering what if we try to see if this detector, the dark side, the dark side detector, could do also a good job at lower masses. Um, the motivation for this was that you have asymmetric dark matter models, I think Graziella mentioned them, where you have, um, if you look at the ratio between the dark matter density over the barons, this gives you a number five, and there was no connection thought at the beginning if this was significant or not. But there are uh, many models which show that if this um, ratio here is different than one, you might, uh, that means um, that can arise from the fact that the, um, the, the ratio, uh, I'm sorry, the ratio between the dark matter density and its anti-dark matter density is different than one. You can have an asymmetry that may, might explain this um, number here. So most of these models have the mass of the dark matter between 1 and 10 GV. So we thought, well, maybe we can find a way to see if um, dark side could go to lower mass, even though it was optimized and built to measure events above 10 GV. So what we did, um, and this I'm happy to say we did this analysis at Sao Paulo, um, is that looking for these events, we decided that we could use the S2 signal only. Why that? Because the scintillation light that is um, emitted when you have such a low uh, WIMP is too low and you cannot detect it. So we showed that you can do a S2 only analysis and for that you have to give up the important feature of pulse shape discrimination. So in order to do this, we had to use, we, we need, what's the problem of not using the, the prompt scintillation light? Is how will you calibrate your, your detector? How will you know the energy that is, um, is transferred to your detector if you don't have the S1 signal? So we found uh, two features that help us do this and it was very um, nice. That was, one was when the getter was off. The getter is the, the, the machine that cleans your liquid organ. So it goes to the liquid organs and it cleans it. So we noticed that for a while when the getter was off, it was in maintenance, you have much more impurities in your detector. And we noticed that during this period, so here we have the number of electrons collected and here the number of events. So uh, when the getter is off, you have this peak here, and when the getter is on, you have much less single electron events. So this is when you have a single electron event. So when the getter was off, you had a lot of impurities, and the impurities would collect the electron and then release it. So you could have a very large number of single electrons and use it to understand what's the uh, number of photoelectrons in your PMT for each electron that goes into the S2 re in the gas bucket. So with this we can calibrate and say that you had 23 uh, photoelectrons per the electron. So it was using a data then in the long, when we say 532 data, we do not use this data because it has a lot of impurities, but we could understand using only the S2 signal how to calibrate our detector. And the second step we took was um, 
If you have atmospheric uh, atom, you will have the presence of organ 37, which will decay promptly, so it's not a problem for the normal um, experiment. But we noticed that when our organ was transported from the US, from Fermilab to Italy, and in this transportation, it was contaminated by organ 37. And organ 37 decays in two modes, in a L and a K shell, and the ratio between these peaks are both measured experimentally as it's modeled uh, theoretically. So here's the data of the first 100 days of this 500 period. And you notice these two peaks, which are expanded here. So this is number of relaxes. So you can see the two uh, decaying peaks of argon-37. And if you measure the ratio between the, the peaks of these two peaks, um, you will get exactly what is expected for organ 37. So with this feature, which was also you know, data that we got rid of, uh, you, can you can define what's the energy transfer for each of the ele single electrons. So with these two features that are not normal data that we use, we found a way to uh, calibrate the detector at low energy. And then we did a Monte Carlo um, where we, um, we show, so we use the sources, two sources, MB data and MC data and to understand um, our detector. And you can see that in red is when you only have a single S2 signal and both, and you can understand uh, most of the data here from this on and using MC data to the lower levels. And we have a model to model um, what's the ionization yield. So when you have the energy transfer, you, the signal that you actually measured is um, lower than what is transferred to the detector. And you have what we call uh, energy quench. So you have to measure what actually is uh, transferred to the detector and that can be um, actually detected. So this is this ionization yield. And we can model it with a, a, a theoretical model and with two sources. So now we know how many photoelectrons are detected per electron that goes to the S2 signal. We know the energy and we know um, the ionization yield from each of these um, events. So at the end, so here is the ionization yield measured with these two sources, and you, this is the line we measured. And you can see you have a very, this is a parameter of this model. You can see you have a larger um, um, uncertainty at lower energies, and these are data taken with other experiments. So this data point is corrected to liquid organ and it comes up here. So what we do is, so this is our measurement and these are other data points. So we use this difference as a systematic um, correction to our uh, data. So with this, we were able to test models, um, the mainly the asymmetric models, which fall in the region between 1 and 10 GV for the dark matter mass. And here, so in these, uh, these solid lines here are the signal you expect for different um, dark matter models. So you have for mo dark matter mass of 2.5, 5, and 10 GV. This is the number of electrons it's expected to um, have detected. And in these lines, in these uh, points here is our data. And these are um, what we know from our Monte Carlo that constitutes our data. So with this, we could put limits for low mass um, dark matter. So this plot uh, here shows the mass of the WIMP and the nucleon, uh, dark matter nucleon cross section. And um, in red is our results, and you have all the other um, ex uh, results above. So you see that. Even with dark side being a very small detector, we could put the best limits for low dark matter um, uh, models 
based on these two features that we understood we could use, although it wasn't the data that we actually used for the analysis. So everything above this is excluded, and the uncertainty here is due to the fact that the nuclear recoil uh, measurement at lower energies have fluctuations, and also they have an uncertainty on the measurements, and these two lines here we don't consider even as an actual detection, but only what would be the sensitivity if we had a better measurement of the nuclear recoil. So our results goes, it excludes everything above from 1.8 GV up. Um, so um, the other result we had was doing a sub-GV uh, search. So we searched in the 1 to 10 um, GV region, and now we went to below 1 GV. So we call this the sub-GV search, and Graziella mentioned a lot of the dark sector. So you have a hidden sector where you have a whole um, dark um, particles, and you will have them connecting to the standard model through portals. And so we checked, and we also redid the analysis exactly in the way I showed for the lower mass, but now it's, so it's uh, only S2 analysis 2, but now the models predict that the dark matter at this level will scatter with the electron of the organ and not with the nucleus. So you end up having um, a form factor, which in these papers are parametrized by two uh, limiting values, a heavy and a light mediator. And what we did then was to look and compare the data as we did before with these models. And the result is that for heavy mediator, <coughs> sorry, dark side will have the best result in a certain region, a small region over here. And light mediator, the Xeno experiments, uh, do better. So, but we could put some limits on this too. So what's next? Um, so next we want to expand our detector. So we had a small detector with 50 Ks, and now we're going to 20 um, tons of data. Actually, it's 50 tons. The name always gets me. Oops. Um, so we'll have an experiment called Dark Side 20K. And Graziella wrote 20T because it's actually 20 tons. So the 20K is because it's 20 and then three zeros. But it's a bad name. Anyway, um, so we're building this detector we will have some key features that will make it much better because when you increase size, you also have um, to take care of the background and make sure that you will have a background free without any neutrons. So we'll have also a dual phase DPC, but now we will um, exchange, we won't use PMTs, but we will use a silicon PM, which has uh, a better uh, response and it also, um, it will be much faster, and it will stay away. It can stay. It won't need feed through, so it can stay away from the TPC itself a little bit more than the the PMT that had to be glued there, and it will have less background. So um, I'll, I'll go through these improvements. So one important, very important um, feature that we had already in in dark side 20, uh, 50K is that we started our experiment with atmospheric organ, but then we had a very big background for low organ 39 events. So here, if you look, so this is S1 again. This um, black curve here is the data we took when we had atmospheric organ, and you see that it's, it has a huge contamination of organ 39. So we explored getting underground organ from a mine in Colorado, and this proved to work very well. So um, here in, in blue is um, the data without um, atmospheric, only with underground organ, and you see that this huge amount of data here is due to organ 39 goes, goes down. So it's very important that we use underground organ. So now we are extracting under, and uh, we we made the extraction work faster. We have 250 kilos per day of um, low um, 
39 organs, so it's, low, it's small contamination. And then this um, organ is sent to Italy, and you have a column that will be 350 meter long, and which will even further purify the underground organ. Um, I just got a message this morning that the prototype for this distillation uh, plant is working very, very well. And so the prospects of having ultra pure uh, underground organ are very good. So this will be very important for the detector. Um, so this is the silicon PM. We have, a, so it's now not photomultiplier tubes, but you have these, um, these um, silicon PM, which have the cells of detection up here. So um, it is, the photon detection is very high, better than PMTs, and it's very efficient. And they are integrated in these tiles, and then they are, the motherboard has 25 of each of these singles here. So this will be a future improvement which will be very good for uh, dark side 50. The other thing is for the neutron abatement, um, we will have a veto that um, surrounds the TPC, which will have some panels which are uh, loaded with gadolinium. This gadolinium is, it captures neutral, so it's neutrons, so you can um, make a very good um, veto with, together with the TPC, and this will reduce the, the neutron beaker much further. Um, so we also have the cryostat will be, so we have a program that's, um, it's uh, neutrino, so protodune is being built and in CERN, so we have a collaboration at CERN with them, and our cryostat will follow the, what they built for, for, for protodune, and this makes, um, so they have a membrane, and this makes it possible that the cryogenic will be far away from the underground organ, because sometimes you have radioactivity, so if you have a vent coming through the cryostat, sometimes it produces neutrons itself. So this will uh, reduce, and in a very good way, uh, the possibility of the cryostat itself producing neutrons. And also the silicon PM, as I said, will be out of the undergrad, uh, underground organ region. Um, so another experiment I want to uh, mention here, and Sao Paulo's group is very active in this experiment, is the RED. So RED is a subgroup of um, dark side, and the idea is that it will measure, it will better measure the energy recoil in liquid organ to try to make the uncertainties of the recoil energy that you measure at low energy much better than it is. So it's an experiment that's going on. It's running now in Catania, Italy. And besides being able to measure the recoil energy, it also is interested in the directionality that Gaziella mentioned that might happen. So mainly they have the electric field that I showed in the TPC which they can change the direction. So then they can compare the nuclear energy measured when the field is in one direction to the nuclear field when it's measured in the other direction, which would make the electrons take a different path. So the idea is to check if it's possible or if there is uh, nuclear uh, recoil energy directionality. Um, so here's the detector, it's a lithium beam that that goes into a target and produce beryllium on one side and the neut and neutrons on the other side. So neutrons, as I said, interacts with your detector in the exact same way as WIMPs. So the idea is here you control the angle and you know the energy of the beam. So you know what's getting in, you measure what's coming out, and you can say how much of the nuclear recoil energy was measured with a, in a controlled setup. So this is to reduce the uncertainties on the, the quenching of the nuclear recoil. And at USP, we're making a very strong effort to try to measure this at very low energies, the lowest energies we can, in order to improve the low mass uh, search, the low mass, the dark matter at low mass search. 
Um, so as a conclusion, um, I put the, I, here's the, the most recent um, exclusion plots we have with the mass of whip mass on this side. Here's the, the cross section. And on solid lines are the current um, exclusions. We have the xenon 1 ton and panda 2 as the better, best exclusion so far in this region. Um, at low mass, we have the dark side that I mentioned here. And here in, um, in this uh, cross region, this is the what's called the neutrino floor. The neutrino floor, as Graziella mentioned, dip is, it depends on a lot of things. It also depends on your target. So when you say neutrino floor, um, it depends on the target. This was made for argon, or for xenon, sorry. So the neutrino floor, floor for argon would change a little bit where it will fall. Um, as you, and then in um, these um, lines that um, are not full, you can see the projection for the future detectors. So this is for a xenon uh, Anton project. Then you have the LZ project. And the dark side, 20 will um, uh, expectations are in this line. You see that for larger masses, liquid organ works better than for lower masses. And if the, the, the global organ collaboration would, would, would be a three ton um, detector, has this line here which reaches the neutrino floor. So the conclusion is that liquid organ is a very good target. It will be complementary to other kinds of experiments like xenon and also the accelerator and um, other experiments. Um, in the near future, I think we will reach the neutrino floor. I think the WIMPs are not um, dead as they're still even in the direct detection. We have some space to try to find and there's many models down here. So it's still a very exciting um, period for, um, I like the blinking, for uh, dark matter detection. And I think it's very exciting both in the experimental side as well as in the model building and theoretical side. So that's it, thank you. Hi, Yvonne. Thank, thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation. I have two uh, curiosity. First of all, you mentioned that this plot includes the, uh, shows the neutrino floor uh, for xenon. Yeah. How um, does the neutrino floor for argon compare to this? Is yes. it better or is it worse? So, so it's um, lower because mainly xenon has 131, the, the Z, and argon is 40. So the interaction goes with the number of nuclei that you have. So it will be, I, the, the fact is, I know we, we made a plot like that for argon, but I couldn't find it with all uh, the results. I only could find it for dark side, so I wanted to show the xenon. So it will go lower in, um, in, in cross-section, so it will be somehow lower here. I don't know exactly how much. Okay, thank you. And another curiosity, uh, I don't know if you mentioned that overall, uh, but given your uh, X, Y measurements with the PMT and Z measurement with the drift, uh -huh. does this mean that you have directionality measurement? Um, well, we have, a, I would call it a position because our field is the same. So um, like red, when they say directionality, the, you need to know if... Um, your um, nuclear recoil measurement depends on the, so if you change the field, the electron direction will change too, right? Mm -hmm. So the question is, will this interfere in the measurement you have or not? So in dark side as well as in, in dark side 50 and 20, um, the field is stable. So we assume that there's no directionality. And so it's just a position of your event for you to know where it happened, the energy loss, and so on. If RED or another experiment tells us that there is directionality, 
then we have to take this into consideration. But we don't use our detector as a directionality measurement. So red does this moving the, the electric field. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I do have a question. So, uh -huh. uh, so why only argon can use the pulse shape discrimination? Oh, it's because... Um, let me I, see. I was thinking that any dual phase detector no, would do the same. Um, because when I say the... So let me see my event Yeah, here. in the very beginning. Yeah. So there's a confusion, and probably because I didn't explain well, and when people talk about this... Um, oh, no, let me go. Ah. Here. There. So um, the thing is, the, the pulse shape discrimination is just with the S1. So some people confuse this of being the drift time between S1 and S2. So no, the thing is that in argon, the difference between the electron recoil, the time, so we have for argon, as the scintillation is emitted, we have these two channels here, a fast mode and a, sm uh, and a, a slow mode. So this happens in argon. So xenon doesn't have this difference between the electron and the nuclear recoil because the light, when it um, goes through xenon, it's different, and they don't have this difference. This difference in light, the in I time, it's much it's shorter. Short yeah. Okay. So this is one of the features that actually motivated yeah. people to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Plus oh. the price. Okay. It's much so cheaper to. So let's leave it for their questions for later. Uh, it's time for we go for lunch, and let's thank the speaker again. Uh, about the lunch, you just downstairs as soon as we get out. There is a stairs, and then you just go there. Okay. Can we leave stuff in here? Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah.